login for the participants. <clears throat> Maybe the oldest job that's always been obsessed with the latest technology. And once in a while, a discovery comes along that changes everything. Selective breeding did it, hybridization did it, and now CRISPR is doing it again. Corteva AgriScience is using a proprietary application of CRISPR to create stronger corn for farmers, offering crops without compromises. With this new approach, we can stack disease-resistant traits on the DNA faster, more efficiently, and more accurately, battling the crop's most pressing threats. More disease resistance, higher yield potential, supercharged. But corn is just the start. Multiply CRISPR's impact out across any crop susceptible to disease, any food system that's threatened. Countless challenges now met with a unique, sustainable solution. It's an R&D breakthrough that will create meaningful impact at a global scale. Corteva is redefining how we all keep growing. And this is just the beginning, because when we change farming, we change everything. Okay, I think, uh... We will start now. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me just. Okay. A pleasant uh, morning to all. Uh, actually, it's a rainy morning. Uh, I am Pan Pilo de Guzman, and I will serve as moderator uh, for uh, today's webinar session. Welcome to the webinar series on biotech innovations for a sustainable agriculture. This activity is a build-up activity for the NBW, organized by the DA Biotechnology Program Office, ISA Inc., DA uh, Bureau of Animal Industry, Biotech Coalition of the Philippines, and Corteba Agroscience. We currently have around more than uh, 400 participants representing uh, different stakeholders, and others are still uh, joining in. Today's webinar is part of the three-day series that explores the role of biotech innovations in driving agricultural sustainability, providing solutions to some of the most pressing problems in the agricultural sector and challenges surrounding it. Uh, before we start, a few house rules. This webinar will run for two hours and will be recorded for documentation purposes. The webinar will also be streamed live on ISA's Facebook page and YouTube accounts of ISA, and I think it will be also in uh, uh, DA Biotech uh, Program's website. Make sure that you have good internet connection so you will not miss any of the discussions. Please turn off your camera and your audio muted during the presentations to avoid any uh, distractions. We encourage interaction exchange, thus we welcome questions from the participants. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen for any questions and clarifications you may have. This indicates to whom you are directing the question. We will entertain the questions during the open discussions. And, and we will ask you to answer a post-webinar survey on day three. So make sure that you complete 
the three day webinar series, and this will be the, the basis of the issue ones of your certificate of participation. Thank you very much for taking your time in attending this webinar, and we look forward to your active uh, participation. Now, for the opening remarks, uh, Dr. Aldimita will uh, give us the opening remarks. She holds a PhD in botany for, from Purdue University, USA, and postdoctoral fellowship on Golden Rice and Albert Ludwig University in Germany. She has served as Chief Science Research Specialist at the Biotech and the Biotechnology Coordinator at Phil Rice and former researcher at ERI. She leads the development of publication of the annual global status of version rice biotech crops of, or ice brief which hopefully will be continued next year. Uh, Dr. Alibit has published 31 papers in scientific journals and proceedings and chapter in two books on biotechnology. She is the recipient of various awards, including the Outstanding Young Scientist by NAS, the NAS and Italy-based World Academy of Science Prize in Biology, then Outstanding Women in Nation Service or TAL, from TANS Foundation, most outstanding research researcher, senior researcher at Phil Rice and Filipino Paces Biotechnology. And of course, the 2020 UPLB College Distinguished Award for Excellence in International Service and Cooperation. You have now the uh, virtual mic, uh, Dr. Aldimita, for your opening yes. remarks. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, dear Popen, and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar series on biotech innovations for a sustainable agriculture, a three-day build-up activity for the 19th National Biotech Week with the theme, Empowering Innovation for Sustainable Future with Biotechnology. The webinar is hosted by us, the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Applications, Incorporated, a nonprofit international organization working to feed the world with knowledge through the packaging of biotech information, development of science communication modalities, facilitating knowledge sharing, capacity building, and assisting domestic biotech programs. At this point, I would like to recognize the organizing team composed of Charmaine Lopez of DA Biotech, Dr. Nina Halos and Dr. Abe Manalo of Biotech Coalition of the Philippines, Karen Panaso of Bureau of Animal Industry, and then us as host, and with the support of Corteva AgriScience, represented by Dr. Antonio Alfonso. This webinar series is quite timely, as efforts toward sustainable agriculture should be more than doubled in order to feed the world population of more than 10 billion by 2050. Business as usual attitude for food productivity will no longer work as problems on population, climate change, and dwindling resources complicate all efforts towards food sufficiency. Our food producers should be equipped with new innovations developed through the continuous understanding of the problems analysis and development of ideas towards some proof con of concept scientific solutions, implementation and verification of the solutions and dissemination of the technology to move for adoption to create the all important changes globally. So in the next three days, we will be tackling innovative technologies developed to address problems in food and agriculture. The topics for the three days are new breeding innovation in crops, the technologies application in mitigating pesticide use and regulation. So this is the top the, the title of the seminar webinar today. And then tomorrow will be on biotechnology application and regulation in animals. And on Friday we will have bio innovations, potential and challenges the concept of social license, and the path to commercialization. We have invited local and international scientists and will devote at most 30 minutes for the question and answer portion every day to further clarify concerns. So let's take advantage of that Q&A. As I said, we had more than um, 
Well, Pop and said we have already more than 400 participants today. We had more than a thousand registrants indicating the interest of the general public, local and international, in biotech innovations for food and agriculture. Thus, we do hope that the three-day webinar will somehow increase your knowledge of biotech innovations in crops, animals, and appreciate their potential to help build sustainable food systems. We invite you to complete the three-day webinar series and, and respond to our post-webinar survey at the end of the third day. This will serve as a reference for improvement, our improvement for future webinars and your ticket to obtain a certificate of attendance. Have a great day, everyone, and happy learning. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Ola, for giving us an overview of what to expect for today's webinar and for the next three days. So we will uh, now call uh, Dr. Uh, Claro Mingala to give us a key message. He is the Director of the Philippine Agriculture and Fisheries Biotechnology Program of the Department of Agriculture. He was formerly the Center Chief of the Livestock Biotech Center of the, at the Philippine Carabao Center at as well as the chair of the drafting committee for the regulation of animal biotechnology in the Philippines. Dr. Mingala received his Doctor of Veterinary Science and Medicine and Master of Veterinary Studies degrees at the Central Luzon State University and finished his PhD in Veterinary Science at the Hokkaido University in Japan, specializing in infectious diseases. He pursued his postdoctoral fellowship in Cornell University, Ithaca, in New York in 2016 under the Fulbright Philippines Agriculture Scholarship Program for Advanced Research. Since then, he worked on the research and development of the diagnostic tools and vaccines for priority livestock diseases. He is the recipient of the 2010 Philippine Veterinary Medical Association Outstanding Veterinarian in Government Service, 2011 Outstanding Scientist, 2016 National Research Council, the Philippines Achievement Award and one of the 2019 phases of biotechnology as the outstanding livestock biotechnologist. Dr. Mingala is a career scientist with the rank of a uh, scientist for Dr. Mingala, please, you can now read your message. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bogben. Good morning to everyone. Welcome to the first day of our webinar series on biotech innovations for a sustainable agriculture. This three days webinar is a build up activity for the upcoming 19th National Biotechnology Week, which will be held on November 20 to 24, 2023 at SMC Side City Cebu. Albeit virtual, we are thrilled to have you all here today for this webinar series to further explore the latest advancements in biotechnology and its impact on Philippine agriculture. We all know agriculture has always been the backbone of our society, providing us with the essential necessities of life, food, fuel, or even fiber. However, the challenges faced by the agricultural sector are growing rapidly, and it is crucial for us to explore innovative ways that can ensure sustainable and efficient agricultural practices. Day by day, we can notice that the global population is skyrocketing. Climate change is also posing a significant threat to our agricultural system with extreme weather events becoming more frequent and unpredictable. And our resources are becoming increasingly scarce. In the face of these uh, daunting challenges, biotechnology has emerged as a game changer. From genetically modified crops that are resistant to pests and diseases, to precision breeding techniques that enhance crop productivity, biotechnology innovations have the potential to re revolutionize the way we produce food. Indeed, the recent progress in biotechnology presents unparalleled possibilities for tackling wide range problems, including climate change, resource scarcity, and health and food security. Throughout this seminar series, we will delve into the various aspects of biotechnology, 
in agriculture and explore the potential it holds for transforming food systems. For this day, we will lay the foundation by discussing the overall concept of sustainable agriculture and how biotechnology plays a crucial role in achieving it. In the upcoming sessions, we will explore specific areas such as new breeding innovations in crops, the technologies involved, their applications in mitigating pesticide, pesticide use, and the regulations surrounding them. We will also dive into the realm of biotechnology applications and regulations in animals or livestock, understanding the potential and challenges they bring. And lastly, we will touch upon the concept of bioinnovation, its potential and the challenges it faces. Here, we will also discuss the importance of social license and the path to commercialization for biotech innovations. As such, we have gathered technical experts from various fields who will share their knowledge and insights with us. They will provide us with valuable information on the latest advancements, trends, and challenges in the field of biotechnology. I highly encourage everyone to actively participate, ask questions, and engage with our esteemed speakers. We will hope that by the end of this series, we will have a clearer picture and appreciation of how biotechnology can contribute to the promotion of a more sustainable and efficient agricultural system. Muli isang mainit na pagbati at pasasalamat sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much. Sama-sama nating suportahan ang biotech innovations para sa isang masagana at matatag na agrikultura. Maraming salamat po. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bingala, for that uh, key message. Indeed, biotechnology has the potential to revolutionize uh, food production system, as you said. And now we will go on to our first topic on new technologies driving the future of plant breeding. This will be presented by uh, no less than uh, Dr. Ordonio, Dr. Reynante Ordonio of San Jose City, Nueva Ecija, first joined the Philippine Rice Research Institute in 2004 after more than two years of teaching at CLSU, where he also obtained his uh, BS, Magna Cum Laude, and MS Biology degrees. He later obtained additional MS and doctoral degrees in Agricultural Science and uh, postdoctoral fellowship from Nagoya University in Japan. He is currently a senior science research specialist at Peel Rice and has been conferred the rank of Scientist One by the Civil Service Commission and DOST in May 2019. He currently serves as the project leader of the Healthier Rice Project at Peel Rice, a collaborative project with ERI, which aims to produce beta carotene and rich golden rice varieties and high iron and zinc rice to address the problem of micronutrient deficiencies in the country. Dr. Odonio's field of interest include plant genetic modification and gene editing. His earlier works have been published in international journals such as Nature Genetics, Nature Scientific Reports, Pinas of USA, and Science Magazine. He was also involved in crafting the Philippines policy on products plant breeding innovations through a DA Biotech Commission study group on new plant breeding techniques in 2018 and in the chair of the Ad Hoc Technical Committee Working Group on MBTs, NBTs under NCBP in 2019. He is also recognized by the National Academy of Science and Technology as one of the outstanding young scientists of 2021. Dr. Ordonio, please, you can now share your slides. Thank you so much, Sir Popen. I hope you can see my slides now. Yeah, it's still loading. Yeah, we're just waiting for it. Yeah, now. Okay, so good morning to... <clears throat> everyone and thank you so much for having me here and for this lovely opportunity to talk about biotechnology. Today I will be discussing the new technologies driving the future of plant breeding. This presentation as requested will focus on the new wave of plant breeding innovations and their potential impact in the future and will also provide an overview of the current global regulatory frameworks for these tools. From the title, when we say new technologies for plant breeding, 
these are the things that will come to our mind. Number one is advanced genome transcriptome sequencing or genotyping tools. And this refers to the NGS or the next generation sequencing systems like Illumina, PacBio, Nanopore, which are really revolutionizing plant breeding right now because they drastically reduced the time and the cost it needs to sequence the whole genome compared to the standard Sanger sequencing. It's good to know that there's a lot of crops and organisms now with elucidated genomes because of these technologies. Number two is advanced analytical tools, which include bioinformatics in the exciting field of artificial intelligence. These technologies allow scientists to build useful databases and to mine and make full use of valuable information from the heaps of data being generated by sequencing technologies and much more. And number three is advanced DNA synthesis technologies. We are not talking here of just short oligonucleotides for synthesis, but rather genes or even genome. Yes, it is now possible to build customized genomes from scratch, and this facilitates precision plant breeding and the rise of synthetic biology. And number four is plant breeding innovations, also known as new plant breeding techniques. PBIs refer to a continuously evolving suite of modern biotech tools that facilitate the development of a product or new plant varieties with desired traits in a way that is faster and more precise than conventional plant breeding techniques. PBIs mainly aim to genetically mimic natural variation to produce a conventional plant product that is not subject to strict GM regulation. But some of the PBIs can also insert a foreign gene from a cross incompatible species, thereby producing a GMO. Here are the eight PBIs that are available to the modern day plant breeder. We have uh, SDNs, ODM or oligonucleotide directed genesis, cisgenesis and intragenesis, RNA-dependent DNA methylation, or RDDM, grafting with GM material, reverse breeding, agroinfiltration, synthetic genomics, and other upcoming techniques. So let's begin um, with the concept of the SDNs, or site-directed nucleases. By the term site-directed, this implies that this technique is targeted and specific, which is a far cry from conventional breeding technique. There are actually different SDNs like uh, zinc finger nucleases, talens, and CRISPR-Cas system. And generally, each differ in terms of their way of recognizing, binding to, and cutting the target DNA. Now, regardless of which SDN is used, the result will be the formation of a double strand break and recently single strand break. And the way such break is repaired and the nature of the insert if any, will ultimately determine how the resulting plants will be treated or classified, whether GMO or non-GMO. Now let's just have some details. Let's start with, um, uh, I mean, further details about oligonucleotide-directed mutagenesis. This is a form of gene editing that does not use nucleases, as in site-directed nucleases. Instead, it uses customized single-stranded oligonucleotides, which, is, which you can see on the left, designed to interfere with the normal replication of DNA in the target region or the replication port. The oligonucleotide with a direct or desired basis, I mean, binds to the complementary region in both DNA strands in the complementary or in the replication port rather. The cell then detects the base mismatch and starts repair, only that it is error prone. And with this, the alternative basis in the mismatch gets copied to the DNA, thereby leaving a mutation. Since the mutation is just a base change, and since the non-replicating oligo introduced eventually gets degraded in the cell, there is no novel combination of genetic materials formed in the products of ODM. So they are non-GMO. And next is cisgenesis and intragenesis. These two methods involve the usual transformation vectors also being used in genetic transformation or transgenesis. The only difference with genetic transformation is that the gene insert is from a cross-compatible or same species. 
for cisgenesis, the gene or allele is taken from the donor unaltered, meaning it has the native promoter, coding sequence, and so on. On the other hand, for intragenesis, the gene insert is altered to some degree, meaning it may have the promoter or coding sequence of another gene or its orientation was reversed. For both techniques, since the inserted gene is just from the same species, novel combination will not be formed. The only consideration are border sequences, which are shown here in this illustration as gray bars at each end of the cis gene and intragene, and these should be considered and this should not result in noble combination of genetic materials. And next is RNA dependent DNA methylation. This method ultimately leads to the methylation of the promoter region of a gene, which essentially silences the gene. Methylation does not affect the DNA sequence, but rather interfering with the binding of activator proteins and transcription factors to the promoter region. So as a result, gene expression is reduced or completely blocked, a condition called transcriptional uh, gene silencing. Now, RDDM technique may involve the integration of an inducer construct into the plant genome using genetic transformation, so resulting in a GMO. The transgene expresses uh, double-stranded RNAs that become small interfering RNAs that will facilitate the methylation. After the transgene is bred out from the plants, the resulting null segregants will have the same genome sequence with the original variety, but have a different trait as intended. And more importantly, no novel combination of genetic materials is produced in the final product, so non-GM. And next is uh, grafting with GM material. In this technique, a plant part is fused to an already approved GMO event. The GMO part can either be the root stock or the scion. Now, in this technique, while the metabolites and other molecules can spread throughout the resulting chimeric plant, the DNA does not spread away from the graft junction. For instance, glyphosate resistance in the rootstock will also be observed in the scion, but the two are still genetically different since DNA is not transferred. Therefore, any product harvested from the non-GM scion, like fruits and seeds, or from the non-GM rootstock, like tubers, will not be distinguishable from and will be treated the same as those produced through conventional breeding. And then we have uh, reverse breeding. This is a method in which we can derive parentals from a hybrid instead of the other way around. The process involves also genetic transformation of the hybrid with unknown parents to silence through RNAi some important genes involved in crossing over during meiosis. The absence of crossing over allows us to preserve the original configuration of the chromatids in gametes or haploid cells, particularly the pollen or microspores. In addition, we also have to double the chromatid through anterculture or doubled haploid technology, which essentially creates diploid plants. This will be candidate parentals from which to select the best combination for recreating the hybrid plant in question. And uh, since transgenesis was used in the first place in this technique, the parentals that will be selected will also have to be rid of transgenes. And ultimately, the null segregant parentals, as well as the resulting hybrid, will have no noble combination of genetic materials. And uh, next is agroinfiltration. As we all know, agrobacterium is widely used in genetic transformation, specifically for transforming cali or undifferentiated plant cells. In this NBT technique, agrobacterium is also used to deliver vector constructs but this time into differentiated tissues such as leaves, flowers, and immature embryos. In agroinfiltration, the possibility of forming novel combination first depends on the type of target tissues used, namely germline or non-germline, and the type of vector construct used, namely if it is meant for expression only or for plant transformation. For non-germline tissues like ordinary leaves, transient expression or expression of the virus particles is usually the case, and the vectors will not be carried on to the next generation. However, for germline tissues like flowers and immature embryo, the use of transformation vectors 
will result in the stable integration of e gene into the plant genome, which will be carried on to the next generation through seeds. Now, if the gene introduced is from a non cross compatible species or a cross incompatible species, the product will be a GMO. However, if the gene introduced is from the same species, there will be no novel combination of genetic materials in the final product, so non-GMO. And the last one is synthetic genomics. This is the engineering and manipulation of an organism's genetic material on the scale of the whole genome based on technologies to design and chemically synthesize pieces of DNA and to assemble them to long chromosome-sized fragments, and such technology includes Gibson assembly. As an NBT, synthetic genomics can create non-GMOs by faithfully duplicating a naturally existing genome, like the genome of COVID-19 virus, for instance. To create the actual COVID-19 virus itself from the genomic sequence data or digital sequence information. It can also create a GMO by introducing slight modifications or trans-like inserts to the genome being assembled. And uh, among the plant breeding innovations, it is gene editing that is gaining ground in the Philippines and in most other countries because of its simplicity and its precision also. In fact, in the Philippines, Erie was already able to publish different papers starting uh, 2017 about their genetically edited or gene edited rice with regards to um, efficient water use and then for resistance to diseases like tungro and also bacterial lip blight. And also in the Philippine Rice Research Institute, we're also now producing some putatively edited lines of rice with resistance to Tungro and VLB and other institutions like the um, IPB or Institute of Plant Breeding, they also have gene edited eggplants. So this will have a very great impact later on in Philippine agriculture. And now I would like to give you some insight into how the different products of plant breeding innovations are regulated globally. Let's begin with the Philippines. The Philippine perspective or the Philippine perspective is that all of the mentioned plant breeding innovations are capable of producing a non-GMO as a final product, as you can see here in this figure. This can be seen under PBI case one on the third column, which are regulated as non-GMOs. And there are some plant breeding innovations that can deliberately produce GMOs. And these are under PBI case two in this illustration, which are regulated under the joint department circular. Now let's go to Argentina. I just superimposed the case of Argentina on the, the Philippine framework for simplicity and for easy understanding. This is not 100% accurate, so just focus on the highlighted or the red text, okay? For Argentina, SDN is case by case, unlike in the Philippines, which is automatically under case one. So that means SDN2 can also be considered as a GMO in Argentina. And, uh, um, and the products also of synthetic genomics are, and also cisgenesis are considered GMOs in Argentina. And then for Canada, it doesn't matter what the technique uh, what technique was used in producing the crop, they're just focused on whether the plant has noble traits. They don't care uh, with how the plant was developed. They only look at the nobility of the trait, meaning if the trait is not present in natural populations of their species, it must be a GMO. Now for the US, they don't care if genetic transformation was used for as long as the, the, the plant or, or plant tests are not involved in the creation of the product. So a GMO can be regulated as a non-GMO in the case of the USA. So they are in stark contrast with Canada. So sometimes there's there are some trade problems with regards to gene edited or products of modern biotechnology. Now for Australia, SDN2, SDN3, and ODM, 
and cisgenesis are all considered as GMOs, while grafting with GM material is case by case. And now, in the case of Japan, SDN2 is case by case, and uh, ODM is to be considered as a GMO. And let's move on to New Zealand. In New Zealand, actually, SDN1, which is in most countries regulated as non-GMO, is considered as GMO in New Zealand. So when SDN1 is regulated as a GMO, this shows that the regulation is very strict. And other techniques would also most likely be considered as GMOs. And also in the European Union, SDN1 is considered as a GMO, SDN3, ODM, cisgenesis, intragenesis. So they're also very strict in the EU. And uh, recently there have been talks on how to relax this and uh, we just uh, hope that everything will just turn out in the favor of the developers. And here are some key takeaways from my presentation. There are different new technologies available to the modern day breeders. And one of them is plant breeding innovations. Genome editing is the most popular among plant breeding innovations. Enabling policies are important for new technologies to have an impact on agriculture. And there are different perspectives globally on how PBIs are assessed. And some countries are lenient, some countries are strict. So that's all, and thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ordonio, for discussing the new uh, breeding uh, technologies that we have now that we can use in improving uh, crop traits and also for providing a, an overview of the regulatory framework of countries and how they treat PBIs in their uh, regulation. Uh, again, I will encourage everybody to the participants to put your questions in the Q&A box and we will uh, address them during the open forum. Now we will proceed to the next uh, topic and this will be on regulatory status of plant breeding innovations in the Philippines. This will be presented by Ms. Geronima uh, Eusebio. He holds the position of supervising agriculturists and serves as the, oh no, no, uh, the second presentation, sorry, uh, will be uh, by uh, Dr. Gabriel Romero on biotic uh, approaches to mitigating pesticide use in agriculture. We will have Dr. Ramis here on more later. And so Dr. Romero is the executive director of the Philippine Seed Industry Association. Prior to that, he was the senior regulatory and scientific affairs lead of Monsanto Philippines for 10 years. He also served as gene bank manager, director of Crop Biotechnology Center, and acting deputy executive director for research at the Philippine Rice Research Institute. He holds a PhD in genetics from University of California, Davis in USA, and a master of philosophy in plant breeding from the University of Cambridge in UK, and a BS biology from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Among his awards are the Outstanding Young Man, Outstanding Young Scientist from the National Academy of Science and Technology, and Paces by Technology from the Department of Agriculture. Dr. Romero, please, you can now share your slides. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Pompey. Okay. Can you see my slide now? Okay, yeah. Okay. It's good now. Thanks. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me here to give a talk uh, on the biotech approaches to mitigating pesticide use in agriculture. I come from the Philippine Seed Industry Association. We are a 33-member strong uh, seed company association in the Philippines. We have... Uh, 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 in uh, multinational seed companies and uh, local seed companies as well as uh, uh, government and uh, academic institutions as members. So happy to be here to share with you uh, this talk on on uh, the mitig mit mitigating pesticide use in agriculture. So the 
agriculture uh, enterprise in general is faced with the daunt daunting task of feeding a growing population, we are expected to uh, have a uh, doubling of a uh, very high pop world population in uh, 2050 that will require a uh, doubling of food production. Uh, since uh, the farm, the arable land and uh, is decreasing or, or remains the same, well, actually decreasing because of uh, the uh, industrialization and other developments and, and conversion. And the number of farmers uh, is also declining. The doubling of the food production will really require uh, efficiencies in uh, in farming technologies so we need to rely on uh, on science uh, research and development to be able to do this we need to be conscious about the sustainable development goals set by the united nations and uh, agriculture is uh, very much a, a key uh, activity that uh, will help the United Nations or the world achieve a zero hunger, a, the sustainable development goal number two. Uh, we are not yet on track. These uh, goals have been set to be achieved by 2030, but we need to make uh, every little progress uh, possible in order to be able to cope with the big challenge uh, in front of us. And um, now that uh, climate change is upon us, we are facing more complicated uh, farming problems, especially the uh, advent, the advent or the uh, rise of uh, different dynamics of pests and diseases. That's why uh, crop protection is very much part of the strategy to increase food production in the world. That's why we cannot do away with pesticides. Uh, usually, people are uh, turned off by uh, the, the, the use of pesticides, but uh, pesticides are, uh, are an integral part of, of our world, not just in agriculture. But uh, for our topic today, uh, we need to focus on agriculture per se because uh, this is where uh, the the challenge of uh, feeding the world population uh, relies. There are different types of, of pesticides used in agriculture, herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. Although for my presentation this morning, I will just focus on herbicides and insecticides. There are various uh, pesticide classifications and um, there are different levels of toxici toxicity uh, to the target pests and also to the farm workers or to, to human health. Uh, in general, it's the bioinsecticides uh, exemplified by Bacillus thuringiensis that are that have the safest uh, safe, that, that have the best safety profile. And among the herbicides, uh, the phosphonomethyl, phosphonomethyl amino acids, uh, where glyphosate belongs, are also generally classified as very safe. So the the question now is, uh, why, why don't uh, we just focus on the use of uh, these safe pesticides? Well, that is really the the intention, but there are special uh, there are uh, other insects or there are other weeds that uh, some of these pesticides cannot control. That's why uh, the other uh, probably more toxic pesticides are still being used. But with the uh, with genetic engineering. We've been able to 
increase the use of uh, the safe um, insecticide and also the safe herbicide. Uh, this one example is uh, the highly successful BT, BT crops. It's uh, BT or Bacillus thuringiensis has been in use in agriculture for more than uh, 50 years. Uh, and then uh, genetic engineers uh, cloned the, the cry protein genes in Bacillus thuringiensis and put them in, in the crops. So uh, these BT genes or cry genes are now expressed in the plant itself. There is uh, no need anymore to spray uh, BT spores or sprays on the plant because that is also less uh, efficient in, in farming because they are... So with genetic engineering, the, the built-in uh, resistance to the insect has been developed. And this is uh, widely successful. Uh, it's not not only in uh, in corn but uh, in other crops as well uh, soybean uh, canola uh, uh, to, um, cotton and and others so actually with the with the development of uh, bt crops uh, in this ex particular example bt corn the use of insecticide has really gone down since the introduction of uh, of the BT corn, this is just an example in in U.S. corn fields. When the BT corn was introduced in 1996, uh, the it has steadily been adopted uh, in larger areas, uh, and the use of insecticide has uh, gone down uh, almost inversely as the adoption of the BT corn. Why? Because the, the BT corn itself uh, can produce its own insecticide. So there's no need to anymore spray uh, other insecticides that will combat the target uh, pest or the Lepidopteran insects in the case of BT corn. And we have that example right here in the Philippines. We've been using BT corn since uh, 2000. Uh, two. So it's more than 20 years now that our farmers have benefited from this technology. Just like uh, insecticides are, in, are indispensable, herbicides also are important in, uh, in farming because they help eliminate the weeds that compete uh, with the crop. So uh, without uh, herbicides or uh, farmers stand to lose 30 to 40 percent of their crops. Okay, so it is also important to uh, to use herbicides. And one of the safest, so far the safest gly uh, herbicide that is available is glyphosate. It is the most thoroughly evaluated herbicide in the world, and the safety profile is outstanding. Okay, so. Uh, it, has, it, it is approved by uh, regulatory agencies in over 160 countries. Okay. There are uh, unfounded uh, allegations against glyphosate, but uh, majority, uh, overwhelmingly, the majority of the regulatory bodies overwhelmingly vouch for the safety of this glyphosate. So if we are concerned about uh, herbicide use in, in farming or in agriculture, why don't uh, farmers or uh, agriculturists uh, focus on, on the use of the safe, on the safe herbicides? And that is also how genetic engineering uh, allowed for farmers to, to focus on, a very, on the use of a very safe herbicide. So this is what, this is the technology behind the use of glyphosate tolerant or uh, glyphosate ready where the brand is roundup how uh, this product came about so glyphosate 
naturally blocks uh, the EPSP synthase in the plant. So if that is blocked, the amino acids that are important in protein synthesis are no longer produced. So uh, there will be uh, the plant growth will be disrupted. So the, the plant will die. But with genetic engineering, uh, scientists have been able to isolate a, a, a gene from the bacteria, agrobacterium, that is resistant to the action of glyphosate. So this particular gene is not affected by glyphosate. So what the scientists did was to uh, insert this gene to the plant so that the plant will no longer be affected by glyphosate. And this was made for corn, soybean, cotton, and canola. So these crops are no longer affected by glyphosate uh, even if uh, the plant or the seedling is sprayed with the glyphosate or Roundup, while the the weeds around these crops are uh, killed by the herbicide. So this is a better illustration of the action of, uh, of uh, glyphosate on the regular plant and on the GM, GM crop, whether corn, cotton, uh, canola, and, and soybean. The regular crop uh, is also killed by glyphosate along with the weeds around it. But the glyphosate-tolerant crop continues to, to grow or survive. So this really makes farming very convenient to, to the farmers because uh, first, they, they won't need to kill the, the land uh, as much as before to, to kill the weeds, to prepare the, the field for for the plants, for, for the crop. Because uh, with, with zero, with no tillage or minimal tillage, the, the farmers can just sow, sow the seeds, the GM seeds, and let the weeds and the, and the crop grow together. Then, then after a few days, just spray the glyphosate and all the weeds around the crops will die. Okay. And because of that, uh, the, the technology has been widely adopted. And uh, with that uh, adoption, there is a lot of environmental benefit because, uh, because of less tillage, there is uh, less use of, of uh, fossil fuel. And uh, because of the adoption also of uh, BT crops, there will be more beneficial insects that, uh, that abound, that, uh, abound in, in the fields because there are uh, no longer insecticides that also kill friendly insects. So these GM crops are very successful globally. And uh, because of the convenience and the, the benefit to the farmers, the benefit to the, to the environment, and uh, the increased production, actually, the increased productivity afforded by these GM crops, a lot of countries are now growing GM crops since 1996. This is the... Uh, data collated by ISA. So since 1996, there are more than 30 countries now that are planting GM crops. So, uh, but these are farmer-friendly technologies. And uh, if you come to think about it, they are technologies that mitigate pesticide use. And we are in the map. Uh, the Philippines is, uh, I think, number uh, uh, 10 or 12 Uh in the hectare of uh, GM crops, uh, in in the hectare of GM crops, and right now we are still uh, we are planting majority of GM crops to to GM corn, but soon uh, we will be planting uh, uh, GM uh, eggplant and uh, also uh, and also golden rice or GM GM rice. Um, because they have been also recently been approved by uh, our regulatory bodies. Okay. So there are um, already 440 gym events uh, approved uh, since the introduction of the first GM crop in the world. Uh, a great majority of them are uh, HT or high, high, high herbicide tolerant or IR insect resistant crops. And most of these crops are stuck 
meaning they contain both the herbicide tolerance and insect resistance in in the same variety but uh, soon we are but now we are also seeing the approval of many other events including the disease resistance uh, traits in in crops so that will also lead to uh, better mitigation of uh, pesticide use in agriculture so so right now we are uh, we have this uh, impact global impact of the judicious application of pesticides that is really the beauty of the application of gm crops uh, we have been uh, uh, we have contributed to uh, better use of uh, pesticides that have the safest safety that have the best safety profiles uh, and that uh, has led to uh, good uh, reduced environmental impact and uh, also uh, of course uh, less impact to to human health in the philippines uh, the the use of the insect resistant and uh, herbicide tolerant uh, crops in particular corn has not only led to to better uh, mitigation of pesticide use but in fact has contributed to the economics of farming uh, on the average uh, our corn growers that are using gem crops gem corn are earning uh uh Additional uh, additional eight thousand uh, pesos per hectare. Now that we are uh, in the in the era or starting era of uh, gene editing, there are also um, opportunities for the use of gene editing to develop insect resistance in crops, and there are two ways to do it. We can edit the plant itself or the crop itself, or we can also edit the the target uh, insect pest, which may be more difficult. But for the editing of um, of plants, uh, there it is possible to knock out the susceptible genes in plants, so that will make the plant resistant uh, to the target pest, and uh, the plant may also be edited to have modified plant volatile blends so it will not be more attractive to the insect pest anymore. Or uh, the editing may also lead to a change in the in the color of the leaves that will also uh, become less attractive to the insect pests. And gene editing is also possible to develop herbicide tolerance in, in crops. And this one is an example of a, a one that is developed in rice. So if you remember, the, the glyphosate tolerance that was developed by genetic engineering needed to isolate the, the gene from bacteria. So with gene editing, that is no longer necessary. The rice itself may just be edited uh, through the CRISPR-Cas technology uh, to do some edits on its DNA. And this is an example of uh, a gene editing done in rice uh, that converted the uh, tryptophan to leucine at uh, the position of position 548 of the acetolactase synthase gene. This uh, protein happens to be um, disrupted by the herbicide by spirab by spirab spiribac sodium herbicide. Uh, this herbicide is uh, also uh, has a, an outstanding safety profile. Maybe not as uh, not as outstanding as uh, glyphosate, but half half of the safety profile of glyphosate. So this is also a, a safe herbicide. So this is uh, this promises to be uh, another way of our new technologies, biotechnologies, especially gene editing, to be able to mitigate the pesticide just by focusing on the safe uh, pesticides. So in summary. Um, Pesticides are indispensable in farming. So we cannot do away with pesticides. But as, uh, as I showed you, uh, some pesticides can be synthetic or organic. And there is continuous development of more efficacious pesticides with better safety profile. That is really necessary okay, for uh, 
for the safety of the farmers and, and the consumers. And genetic engineering already created highly successful and widely adopted GM crops containing the safest insecticide, and that is Bacillus thuringiensis, originally uh, only used in organic farming, and compatible with the safest herbicide, just like glyphosate. And uh, gene editing is now at the threshold of a new wave of products that can further mitigate pesticide use in agriculture. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and be happy to participate in the Q&A later. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Romero, for highlighting the importance of crop protection on agricultural productivity and also uh, on the use of uh, biotech crops to promote judicious application of pesticides that contributes to beneficial environmental impact. So we will uh, now move the last presentation on uh, regulatory status of plant breeding innovations in the Philippines. This will be presented by uh, Ms. Hieronima Eusebio. Uh, she holds the position of supervising agriculturists and serves as the OIC head of the Bureau of Plant Industry by Technology Office, the central hub for GM applications and biosafety permit issuances. Additionally, she chairs the Biotechnology Core Team Plant Breeding Innovations Group, responsible for conducting technical consultations to assess and determine the regulatory status of PBI products. Ms. Eusebio is also a deputized plant quarantine officer with prior experience as the head of National Plant Quarantine Service Division, Central Laboratory for Pests and Disease Diagnosis. She has presented represented the Philippines as delegate to the ASEAN Task Force on Genetically Modified Food Testing Network, or GMFNet, and served as a national focal point of the... Uh, can you please kindly mute your... Okay, let me continue. Uh, her academic credentials include a Master of Science degree in Agricultural Plant Biotechnology from the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences in Budapest, Hungary as well as a Bachelor of Science degree in Plant Pathology from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Uh, Emma, you can now share your slides. Okay, Sir Popan, thank you very much. Okay. Light show, please, Emma. Uh, can you see my slides, Sir Popan? Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Screen now. Okay. okay, okay, you can proceed. Okay. So, okay. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizing committee for extending the invitation to discuss the regulatory status of plant breeding innovations in the Philippines or the Philippine policy for gene edited products. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Next. Let me, sorry, let me provide an overview of the policies development. In 2018, the Philippine Department of Agriculture initiated the study titled A Review of the New Plant Breeding Techniques from a Regulatory Perspective. This study was conducted by a team of uh, respected scientists and regulators. The primary objective of the study was to assess whether the application of NBT would result in products with novel genetic combinations. The findings of this study laid the groundwork for policy recommendations. Then the study was subsequently presented to the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines as they are responsible for developing biosafety policies within the country. Following this, uh, the NCBP issued resolution number one series of 2020 titled the regulation of plant and plant products derived from the use of plant breeding innovations or new breeding techniques. Okay. These are the key resolutions from the committee. PBI products can be categorized as either GMO, 
which contain another combination of genetic material through modern biotechnology or non-GMO or conventional product if they lack a novel combination of genetic material. If PBI-derived products are deemed GMOs, they will fall under the regulation of 20 partner circular uh, 2021. However, if PBI-derived products are not GMOs, they will not be subject to JDC regulation. And the third one, the Department of Agriculture is designated as the lead agency responsible for evaluating and monitoring PBIs or NBTs. The resolution was signed by seven department secretaries and CBP uh, scientist members and organization representatives. In accordance, uh, so this is the memorandum circular number eight, discovers rules and uh, reg procedure to evaluate and determine when products of plant breeding innovations are covered under the DOST, DA, DNR, DOH, DILG Joint Department Circular Number One Series of 2021, based on the NCBP Resolution Number One Series of 2020. Okay. So, in accordance with NCBP Resolution Number One Series of 2020, PBIs or a plant breeding innovations as are defined as novel array of molecular tools that facilitate the precise and efficient development of new varieties, new crop varieties with desired characteristics. These tools are notably more precise and expedite the breeding process. According to the policy, the PPI products can be categorized as either GMOs or non-GMOs, which are conventional products product is classified as GMO if it contains novel combination of genetic material. Conversely, if the end product lacks novel combination of genetic materials, it falls under the category of non-GMO or conventional. PBI product with novel combination of genetic material will be regulated under JDC1 2021. Okay. okay. So the technical consultation for evaluation and determination, or what we call TSED, is a technical evaluation of the PBI product to determine whether the final product of the PBI use contain a novel combination of genetic material, and therefore whether the PBI product falls under the coverage of JTC1 2021. The conduct of the technical evaluation and determination on the regulator, regulatory status of PBI product shall be the responsibility of the TSED group, which shall be composed of at least two members of the Biotech Board Team Plant Breeding Innovation T group and an external expert if necessary. So a product developer, which you can see the list here, may include uh, the department, university, and so on, may submit it is set request. For instance, in the case of non-resident product developer, the that is said request can be submitted through a representative residing in the Philippines. This illustration provides an overview of the process of determining the regulatory status of a PBI product pursuant to the AMC. 2022. The entire process takes approximately 27 to 32 working days. It consists of three phases with detailed explanation to follow in subsequent slides. First one is the pre-assessment phase, which is completed within three working days. This is being done by the Biotechnology Secretariat. And the second phase involves the technical consultation, evaluation, and determination spanning 24 days, which coincides with 10 working day public consultation period. And the final phase necessitates five working days for the official determination of whether the PBI product is classified as GM or not GM. These slides provide an overview of the procedural prerequisites for the said. The, the first step 
is the submission of a request for the set with supporting documents. Uh, you can see the submission requirements listed in this slide. The printed electro electronic copy of the set request form, accomplished prior evaluation form, and the scientific studies, experimental evidence, and other documents to support the claim in the PEF. That the said request form reflects essential details about the product developer, while the PEF contains information on the type of organism and species involved, the PPI technique used, novel characteristic introduced, and evidence of the desired genetic change changes. The BPI Biotechnology Office shall then review this submission and is and is and it is considered officially accepted when it meets the required criteria in both form and substance. Once accepted, it will be forwarded to the biotechnology core team plant breeding innovation within three working days to constitute the said that will evaluate the request. Okay. Here is one of the requirements for the submission that is said request form. This form encompasses essential information such as the name and contact details of the product developer and when applicable, an appointed agent. It also mandates a sworn, sworn statement from the agent affirming the authenticity and accuracy of all submitted documents. Okay. Here is the second uh, uh, form required, the prior evaluation form, which provides a more comprehensive breakdown of the plant breeding innovation procedures uh, employed, like what uh, Dr. Antonio mentioned earlier, the SDN1, SDN2, SDN3, and others. Then they have to identify the sequences of the guide RNA, the delivery system, whether it's agro or other methods. And then a uh, nucleotide sequence to be introduced, if applicable, and other relevant information. As you can see, this form contains a section to be answered by the TSED group. This is where the technical the, the determination of the TSED group shall be indicated. So we have to affix our uh, signature in this form uh, after. Uh, final determination of the regulatory status of the PBI product. Okay. This slide outlines this process of conducting the said. So following the official uh, acceptance of the submission, the BP, BCT BPI shall constitute the said. This group includes a minimum of two experts from BPC, BCT PBI if required an external specialist. In the determination of the regulatory status, so in case of uh, the reduced browning banana, we engage an external expert to participate in the evaluation. And the primary objective of the evaluation process is to determine or to discern whether the PBI product consists of novel combination of genetic material. If that is said, requires clarification during the discussion or during the evaluation, the product developer might be asked to participate in the deliberation process. At the conclusion of this said, the this said group shall make its technical determination and the biotechnology office shall then endorse the technical determination within seven working days to the BPI director. The, the entire evaluation process is designed to be conducted within 24 working days. Okay. So you, uh, Dr. Aldonio already presented this decision tree. Actually, this, uh, this is an annex of the NCBP resolution number one, which shall be used by TSED as guide in making technical determination on the regulatory status of the PPI. So I will no longer discuss this one since Dr. Aldonio already ex extend extensively discussed this um, figure and this flow chart. Okay. So this is again the portion of the PEF or the prior evaluation form where the said group shall indicate its technical determination after the conduct of the said 
that is said group shall determine whether the PPI product contain, does contain a novel combination of genetic material, at which case they will check the second box or does not contain a novel combination of genetic material, at which case they will check the first box. The public commenting period is another step uh, during the processing of submission. Once an officially accepted uh, request is received, it is posted on the Bureau of Plant Industry website within 10 working days to gather feedback from the public and to ensure transparency in the process. It is important to note that only technical um, comments will be taken into account during the final determination of the request. The last step of the process is the official determination of the submission request by the BPI director. The director has five working day window to make a decision after receiving recommendation from the said group and technical input from the public. The regulatory status of the PPI product is officially determined as GM. Then the product developer will be advised to proceed with their application under JDC 1, 2021. If non-GM, they will be given a certificate of non-coverage. And uh, the CNC is made public uh, by posting on, on the BPI website. So this is the uh, certificate of non-coverage if the determination is non-GM. Here are some important notes on the certificate of non-coverage. It shall refer to the noble characteristics introduced in the current variety and the subsequent progenies. It applies to all germplasms of genetic or genetic backgrounds that will contain such characteristics produced by the product developer when, or its licensing in further breeding. And most importantly, the certificate of non-coverage does not excuse the product developer from complying with other relevant regulations regulations of the Department of Agriculture and other government agencies such as the in, those involving plant quarantine, pest rate analysis, varietal registration, and crop-specific standards and programs. The policy also includes the provision for appeals. If a party feels aggrieved, they have the option to file an appeal with the Department of Agriculture Secretary. This appeal must be submitted within 15 working days following the posting of the determination decision on the BPI website. So what are the salient points of the policy? It, pre it prescribes a product-based approach on the determination. There is a recognition that PBIs can generate both GM and non-GM plants as products. Hence, the evaluation and determination focuses on the nature of genetic change that is present in the product. This is in contrast with the process-based approach where products of a certain BBI are immediately determined as either GM or non-GM by virtue of the employed process technique alone. And second, it is not a regulation on product safety, whereas the JTC 2021 employs the job for the assessment of the safety of uh, GM plan for human, animal, and the environment, the DC, DAMC-8 uh, tasked the dessert group to determine the PPI product, if it is GM or not GM. And then there are two types of determination, the, the regulatory status of PPI. The technical determination is made by DSED, while the official determination is made by the collector of BPI. In making the official determination and the regulatory status of PBI product, the, the director considers both the technical determination, which indicated in the company's PEF, by the said, and the technical information from the public during the commenting period. Okay. So if you have further questions, you can reach us both through this contact information. I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. 
Emma, for providing an overview of the guide guidelines in the assessment of products of uh, PBIs and for emphasizing that the current regulation on PBIs is not a regulation on uh, product safety, but rather the evaluation and determination if the PBI is a GM plant or a GM product. And yes. then uh, JDC will, one will take care of the evaluation of the safety of uh, GM plants, if it is a GM plant. Uh, for those who are asking about the presentations, we will make available the presentations and the recordings in the ISA website, of course, after the completion of the webinar series. So you have to wait until we completed uh, the series and, uh, until day three. So we will now proceed with the uh, open uh, forum. And we have quite a number of questions uh, in the chat box. And uh, there is one uh, question here from an anonymous attendee. And we acknowledge our participants from outside the country. Uh, there's a question here about GMO products if they can harm our daily intake. Uh, can anybody from the panelists answer this? Maybe we can ask Dr. Ordonio and Emma can uh, supplement the answer. Dr. Ordonio, please. This sure, is a very you. basic, I think this is a very basic you. question. Uh, is GMO uh, food products can harm our daily intake? I don't know what that means. Part and partial po ng GM regulation, particularly yeah. in the Philippines, is to ensure the safety of our GMO products in terms of human health, animal health, and the environment. And we have a rigorous biosafety process. It has been established since year 2020, I mean 20, 2000, 2002, and earlier. And we have 30 decades actually of biosafety regulation in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And because of that, our regulatory system is very much functional and okay. we always focus on the safety. The fact that approved siya, the fact that it was approved by different regulatory agencies during the process, then it would certify that it is safe indeed. Okay. Yes. Uh, Can you add to uh, that, uh, Emma? Yes. We have international uh, protocol or standards being followed in assessing the safety of these GMOs. So we are signatory to uh, international um, bodies to ensure that uh, GMOs that we introduce to our consumers, to the public, are safe. So based on the applications that we've received, uh, we have issued biosafety permit indicating that they are safe. So it's case-to-case -case basis depending on the submission or the technical documents submitted uh, to the regulators. And it will be the basis in assessing the safety of this uh, GMOs for human, animal health, and the environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emma. So another question from our uh, participant. How can we strike a balance between promoting the adoption of innovative plant breeding methods and ensuring they do not harm biodiversity or have in unintended ecological consequences. Anybody from the panel can answer this one? Uh, maybe Dr. Uh, Gabi, since you uh, discussed about some environmental benefits on the use of the biotech crops. So the question is, how can we strike a balance between promoting the adoption of innovative plant breeding methods and ensuring they do not harm biodiversity or have unintended ecological consequences? Uh, Dr. Gabi? Okay. The question um, may also apply to GM crops. Mm -hmm. So, the in, in terms of harming biodiversity, that is not really what happened with GM crops. Because with the use of BT crops, let's say BT corn, the cornfields have become more uh, 
uh, I mean, I become more friendly to other insects. Yeah, there are now more uh, non-target insects abund ab that are uh, that abound in in farmers' fields. Unlike before, when insecticides uh, against corn borer was heavily used. The non-target insects are also affected. So in terms of the biodiversity impact, the GM crops have increased biodiversity. And in terms of ecological consequences, GM crops are also the herbicide-tolerant crops, in fact, have contributed to less use of uh, fossil fuels. So it's been in record that uh, it's like Mm -hmm. Removing, uh, I think thousands of cars from from the roads because of less use of fossil fuel because there is no longer uh much cultivation or land preparation use using you know fossil fuels diesel etc. So the the question is not really accurate because GM crops and now we are looking at gene editing as even a more efficient technology. They, in fact, contribute to increasing biodiversity and reducing or actually avoiding uh, ecological or impact to, uh, to, to ecology or to the environment. Mm -hmm. So I think... The, uh, we really need to rethink about our assumption that GM crops are harmful to biodiversity because our yeah, our experience with GM crops is they in fact contribute to the biodiversity and they also uh, help prevent you know ecological disasters. Okay. There is a follow-up question, and maybe this is addressed to uh, Dr. Ordonio since he discussed about the new wave of uh, available new plant breeding tools. Uh, as climate change continues to impact agriculture, how do you foresee these new plant breeding techniques contributing to the development of climate-resilient crops and sustainable uh, farming practices? Uh, Dr. Ray? Yes, in this um era of climate change you know we have really breed crops in the soonest time possible we have to release them in a relatively shorter period of time and that's where in editing comes in handy because we can develop crops in less amount of time compared to conventional breeding and it's even more precise like in the case of drought resistance probably later on we can identify some genes and we can click or edit that in the particular crop that we like. And then we can probably reduce the time in the development of such crops, drought tolerance, for example, for the grain yield in the face of climate change. It's very useful, I think. Okay, thank you. There is an, another question maybe you can also answer. This is uh, a live uh, from our uh, FB Live uh, posting uh, from Miss Karen uh, Barondok Albiar. And the question is, how do we reconcile using non-GMO products produced from processes using recombinant technology for use in organic agriculture? The new PBIs for feed or food ingredients is in inevitable. I think using products classified as non-GMO should be considered for organic agriculture as well. Uh, Ray? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If I got the question correctly, in the Philippines, we have the RA100 or 10068 or the Organic Agriculture Act mm -hmm. of 2010 in which it defines genetically modified organisms as not fit in the standard, right? And so golden rice, for example, is considered as non-organic. It is not possible in organic agriculture. And that act was enacted in 2010. And after that, the Bao created their resolution in, in their city prohibiting coexistence of GM and 
conventional crops. And other municipalities followed suit. Even the Science City of Munoz now has that organic agriculture um, resolution. And um, actually, in the original Organic Agriculture Act, there's no mention of the non-coexistence. Only in the Dabao resolution was it there. So it was then copied. So we just hope that for the other municipalities, there won't be that coexistence principle in there. They can actually make it more lenient because the DA is both promoting organic agriculture and the standard conventional agriculture. Both of those are beneficial to our country if we can just use them properly. So because of that, I don't have any problem with organic agriculture. It's just that existence of both must be allowed. And with the gene editing, the beauty of gene editing is that later on, it will be approved as a non-GM and the more that it will be acceptable to Filipinos. Thank you. Uh, can you add anything, uh, Emma, uh, about organic farming and the use of uh, GM uh, crops? Emma? Yes, uh, the DA has both, Dr. Ordonio already mentioned that DA has both policy on organic farming and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the use of, uh, uh, promoting the use of um, products of modern biotechnology. So uh, there are areas in the Philippines that promote organic and they don't want uh, the entry of this GMO. So the the regulators also uh, respect this um, this uh, preference of the local government units if they don't want uh, uh, GM uh, products in their locality. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, it is one of the conditions stipulated in the biocity permit that the uh, technology developer has to respect that ordinances uh, existing in a certain locality. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, there's a question, I think this is addressed to Dr. Ordonio, uh, from William Teres Jr., Tebes Jr. How does gene editing of rice impact its nutritional content? And additionally, if this technology is commercialized, how will it affect pricing? Ray? Gene editing, it depends on target gene. If the gene is involved in nutrition, it will have an impact on the nutrition uh, value of that crop, but otherwise, only the traits that are not about nutrition will be affected. So it, it really depends on the target mm -hmm. gene. That's why it's called precision breeding, because we know the target gene and we know the eventual phenotype of such of such plant or variety. And when it comes to commercialization, it should be the same with the ordinary variety in terms of price, in terms of how you plant it. Everything should be the same except for targeted play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and, and I think this is a question about uh, insect resistance. Uh, majority of our farmers now using GMO product uh, are using GMO product. How comes that they are experiencing in infestation of fall uh, army worm around uh, Isabella area? Uh, who can answer this one? Uh, Doc Gabby, do you have any experience about army pole worm uh, infestation uh, infestation in the area of yeah, Isabella? Ar yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for that question. Pole army worm is uh, a new pest that came to the Philippines, I think, mm -hmm. uh, three, three or four years ago. So, and it is ravaging our crops, especially, I think, onion, especially. Uh, and to some extent, uh, maybe a considerable extent, corn. So the the insect resistance in in BT corn, the in in the present um, traits uh, in our corn varieties and our corn hybrids, some of them can control fall army worm, especially the the ones that have uh, two cry genes. The one, the, the varieties or the hybrids that only contain one cry gene or BT gene is, is, is uh, somewhat susceptible 
So, and yeah, maybe you, you saw that in the farmers' fields. That's why mm -hmm. there is really a need to have continuous development of uh, of insect resistant crops, insect resistant corn. This is really a a serious battle against fall army worm. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, I I think there are now available uh, corn hybrids that uh, that I said contain at least two BT genes that can control, that can manage this whole arm, army worm. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully our farmers shift to the use of this stock or pyramided, these pyramided corn hybrids so that the whole army yeah. worm will be uh, stopped in, in their fields. And hopefully the um, research-based companies continue to develop really efficacious um, mm -hmm. insect-resistant hybrids because we don't know whether fall ar army worm fall army worm will be the, the last to be into to be introduced as a new pest in the country there may mm -hmm. be some some new insect pest that may come mm -hmm. so and because of climate change this is a distinct possibility that's why we need to empower our R&D institutions, also facilitate our, or also empower uh, research-based companies because this is a continuing battle against uh, pests uh, and diseases in our farmers' fields. But that's okay. true. That's true. Our insect-resistant hybrids, especially the ones that have only one cry gene, uh, seem, seem to uh, yield or, I mean, so come to fall our army one. Okay, and I think this is a uh, the question is connected to the previous question. Does spraying BT the organic pesticide to BT corn makes the fall army worm more tolerant? I don't know, but uh, the, you know, the, we can try. Uh, <laughs> there may be there may be multiple uh, actions or mode of actions of the BT sprays. So we have to explore, we have to explore. Mm -hmm. What I know is the, the GM1s, the GM1s with multiple BT genes are re resistant to fall ar army worm. So yeah, we can, the farmers can explore both the, the BT sprays and even the use of the GM corn uh, against fall army worm. And there may be companies that are, or, or yeah, companies that may be offering BT sprays that are really good uh, for against fall army one. Okay. And I think this question is addressed to Dr. Ray. Uh, is it possible that in the near future, crops would be able to mutate their own genes without the use of breeding techniques to increase its tolerance to pests and other diseases? So instead of doing gene editing. You know, Sir Pompe, there is such yeah. thing as a spon Yeah, there is such thing as a spontaneous mutation. And this okay. goes hand in hand with evolution. And you know, okay. evolution takes place in millions of years. It's happening up to now, actually. And the the that's the reason why we are, you know, improving plant breeding innovation tools is to speed up the process of changing, of modifying the genetic makeup of plants such that they can be more useful to us. If we just allow them to mutate by themselves, then it will be too late when the time comes that we have to address climate change, for example. That's mm -hmm. why we have to really invest on gene editing technologies and other new technologies. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, this question is, I think uh, anybody can answer or everybody can answer. Based on your assessments, how deep is the understanding of the grassroots, including the local government units, about GM crops? Emma, can you provide the first answer? <laughs> yes. Actually, in areas wherein there is high adoption of GMO, uh, they very well know, they know very well uh, GMOs. But though in those areas that uh, like BT corn, because we introduced first BT corn, uh, there's very limited knowledge uh, 
uh, about GMOs. So uh, those in those areas, we have to strengthen the um, our information com campaign about the introduction of this technology and how they will benefit from using this technology. So pretty well they know in those areas with high adoption of GM crops. But there are also areas where in very limited knowledge on the use of this technology. Okay. Ha, Ray, how about uh, uh, understanding completely... of uh, the grassroots? Uh, about it, The question is about understanding of the grassroots. And... I completely agree with Mom Emma. Okay. Uh, with regards to that, yeah, because of our Golden Rice project, we were able to go to different places. And um, yeah, for majority of areas, they are not yet aware of what GMOs are. And sometimes because of the lack of awareness, they issue resolutions against GMOs when in fact, when mm -hmm. asked, they are actually in favor of GMOs. So there's that the disconnect between what they think and what they do in, in terms of writing resolutions, for example. So we really have to intensify our uh, outreach to them to educate them, awareness campaigns like that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know who, who can answer this one. Uh, how does the distinction between GMO or non-GMO relate to intellectual property rights? property rights, specifically patents. I'm not quite sure who can... Or maybe, Ray, can you answer this one? How yeah, does the for... distinction between GMO or non-GMO relate to intellectual property rights, uh, specifically patents? Yes, for GMOs, yeah, private companies are being involved there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's... Uh, something to be guarded. I mean, the, the IP is something to be guarded in their case. And that's uh, actually um, very, I mean, very important in the case of mm -hmm. private companies, the, the, the patents. For gene editing, the same is true. Actually, it's not yet clear for us regarding the commercialization of gene edited crops later on. As of now, we're using vectors they are licensed to us for research purposes only. But then later on, by the time that we are already going to commercialize our crops, still another hurdle is how to get the license for commercialization. So that's um, something, an issue in terms of gene editing. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, and I think the question is for uh, uh, Dr. Gabby. Is there, aside from the yield guard, and the uh, stock trait uh, around up red corn. Are there any other corn varieties that will be available in the market? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, these companies are uh, working in earnest uh, to develop new uh, insect resistant varieties. I just don't know uh, what, what events they are creating. Uh, but it's also their strategy to combine the existing the existing uh, tri genes or also beep beep uh, genes so all these approved insect resistant genes may just be combined and this combination is already a powerful new product that can be sold in the market so just yeah ex expect these companies to to be uh, introducing new products but uh but they still have to hurdle or uh, pass our regulatory agencies uh I, yeah that's that's a hurdle that that they need to pass and that will that will also that also requires some time maybe two or three years in the mm -hmm. process but uh the 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 starting materials are already there to to combine this uh, ex these approved existing genes and mm -hmm. and aside from them from these existing genes they are also working hard to to use gene editing to to also produce new uh, insect resistant genes that will that can be put in in corn and other crops so 
yeah, expect that there will be new waves. Uh, well, hopefully the regulatory uh, bodies may also be able to cope with these applications. So, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I call to to the government to provide more funding to BPI, more people, so that uh, these applications can be uh, processed fast so that uh, our farmers can already hmm. will will benefit uh, from these new products okay thank you very much uh there's a question here about uh use of uh, irradiation in uh new plant breeding innovations what is the measurement for the level of radiation to assure safety in plants No, uh, radiation is not involved in any of the new plant breeding techniques. I think you're referring to mitogenesis, and okay. that's not plant mm -hmm. breeding innovation. That's a conventional plant breeding mm -hmm. that is being used since the 1920s, like that. Okay, and then there's a question about uh, the, the contribution of biotechnology innovations on environmental impact. Reduction in agriculture, agriculture, and I think this has already been answered by, uh, Gabby. Uh, another question in relation to GMO crops and human health. Why are some countries ban GMO food products, and some of the consumers look for non-GMO certified products? Anybody can answer that question. It's a matter of preference, Sir Popen. Mm -hmm. And it's not actually uh, uh, totally banning the GM. In Europe, they, they ban the planting, but they still import GM products. So they still use uh, GMOs in, uh, for processing. They're, um, they still source from other countries, from U.S., raw materials to process their uh, food. So it's not a total ban, but more on uh, planting in EU and in mm. other countries. Majority, it's, it's, it's for planting ban in EU, but they still use uh, GM, uh, GMs as raw materials. Oh. The question now, the question here now is how can uh, uh, farmers, smallhold farmers, better access this new plant breeding innovations. Any suggestions from our panelists? Uh, right now, we just had the first policy on gene editing approved here in the Philippines. So I think this is the start. Um, um, in fact, there was already application approved by the ABPI, the tropic non-browning banana, right? And I believe more and more crops would follow suit. There will be mm -hmm. additional mm -hmm. applications later on, like rice, for example. And uh, I think that this the, the environment now is more conducive than ever towards the proliferation or the commercialization of modern biotech crops. Okay. Uh, another question is, is there a possibility to emerge new bacteria or insect due to mutation? Adapting to the capability of GMO crops. Anybody can answer, or Doctor A can can you answer? Is there yeah, a possibility? You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a bacteria or other organism. You can just get the DNA. What matters is the gene. You can take it from any organism, and then doing genetic engineering, you can transfer it to another organism like plants. As long as you comply with the regulatory process, then you're fine. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think we have covered quite a lot of questions. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, panelists, for your answers, for giving clarifications to the questions. Uh, it's already 10 before 11, and... I think I need to uh, provide uh, a synthesis uh, for today's activity. Uh, 
for the uh, for the certificates of appreciation uh, to our panelists we will send it to you by email thank you very much and i think uh, can i ask uh, the, all the participants to give a round of applause virtual applause to our panelists to our resource speakers now i, I proceed with the with the synthesis uh, this webinar series is envisaged to contribute in promoting an enabling environment for the adoption and use of biotech innovations in transforming Philippine agriculture as a productive and sustainable sector. As underscored by Dr. Mingala in his key message, there's a need to address daunting challenges in agriculture. Biotechnology is recognized as a game changer with the potential to address these challenges challenges and revolutionized food production system. The first presentation by Dr. John Odonio discussed the different plant breeding innovations and their potential impacts on agriculture. Advances in knowledge about specific gene functions and plant genome, data analytical tools such as bioinformatics, high throughput genotyping and phenotyping tools, and DNA synthesis technologies among others, provided the needed tools for new plant breeding innovations. New plant breeding tools include site directed nucleases, ogilonucleotide directed mutagenesis, cisgenesis and intergenesis, RNA dependent DNA methylation, grafting with GM material, agro infiltration, and synthetic genomics. Genome editing is the most popular among the PBIs, considering targeted and efficient genetic changes to pr produce beneficial traits. It is emphasized that enabling policies are important for the adoption and use of plant breeding innovations. The second presentation by the, uh, Dr. Gabi Romero highlighted the importance of crop protection on agricultural productivity and sustainability. The use of pesticides, such as fungicides, insecticides, and herbicides has been an integral mm -hmm. part of crop protection regime, enabling plants free from diseases, reduction in crop losses, and protection against weeds. The use of biotech crops promotes judicious application of pesticides and contributes to beneficial environmental impact. Gene editing offers new tools for the develop for developing crops with insect res and this is resistance and herbicide tolerance. The last presentation of Emil Eusebio provided an overview of the guidelines in the assessment of products of plant breeding innovations. The evaluation and determination of PBIs focuses mm -hmm. on the nature of genetic changes mm -hmm. in the product. The current regulation on PBIs uh, mm -hmm. under DA uh, mm -hmm. Memorandum Circular Number 8, Series of 2022, it's not a regulation of product safety, but rather the evaluation and determination if the PBI is a GM plant or a product. JDC number one series of 2021 covers the evaluation of the safety of GM plants for human and animal health and the environment. So in summary, the key takeaways from the three presentations are the following. There's now an array of uh, new breeding techniques or plant breeding innovations available for improvement of crop traits. Gene editing is becoming the prepared tool because of targeted and efficient genetic changes to produce beneficial traits. The use of biotech crops promotes judicious application of pesticides that contributes to beneficial impacts to the environment and uh, Department of Agriculture, MC number 8, series of 22, 2022, offers guidelines on the regulatory pathways for products of NBTs or PBIs, while JDC number 1, series of 2021, covers safety evaluation of the DGM plants. With that, I thank you all the participants and our uh, resource speakers for uh, this webinar. And... We can conclude this webinar. I hope we can see you again tomorrow and on day three. And you can complete the webinar series. Do you have a parting words from our, from Dr. Uh, Aldimita, please? Uh, there are still a lot of questions, uh, very minor ones that were not addressed. 
So uh, email us. Uh, uh, a lot of them are dealing still with GM and um, biosafety. Uh, yeah. We can raise them up tomorrow, although tomorrow it's going to be focused on animals. Today it's on, on crops. Um, also, uh, there are also questions about the availability of PowerPoints, and we have already, and Dr. Um, uh, Sir Popen already told us a while ago that it'll be available next week as soon as all of the presentations are over. So th the webinar is still Friday and uh, we will have it ready by next week. The certificates will be available also on Friday as we finish the webinar series. And if you respond to the evaluation survey at the end of the third week, uh, third webinar, okay? So thank you so much to all our speakers. Thank you so much, Sir Popen, for a wonderful moderatorship. And uh, we hope to see you. You will be using the same link so that you won't get lost. And I hope to see you all. We were able to, to have around 450 attendees today. And you can also invite all your friends to come over and so that we can discuss now about mm -hmm. biotechnology, something new to the Philippines. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you all again tomorrow, all the participants today. Thank you. 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 Yeah. So this is the this is the webinar. Thank you, for... Thank you Ray. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everyone. You, Thank you, Emma. Army mi sa sabihin ka chat mo nila. Devon is done. Yay! One down. Uh. Sino may kailangan ng synthesis pa? Should I? I'll send the synthesis to kanino? Janine. Or, ha? Si Janine? Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, EJ and Tain, for the live FB and YouTube. And Thank Pat. you so much, Ma. Thank you, Sir Popen, mm -hmm. for the moderator.